تو قدر آب چه دانی که در کنار فراتی زنی مصانی ایرک بنتهی مفیل فدواتی تو قدر آب چه دانی که در کنار فراتی شبم در روی تو روز است سلام ویلکم تو نظر ادیشن محبان فاطمه پادکست we hope you have enjoyed the previous podcast while also learning from them. Last week we did not have a podcast due to limited time we had, so we are back this week with the fourth podcast, El Temas Dua. In about one month or so, we will be arriving at a very special occasion, Eid al-Qadir. Many of you know what this day is about. It is the day of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam introduced Imam Ali alayhi salam as his successor to all Muslims. On this day, on his way back from Hajj, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gathered the people at a site called Qadir al-Khum and performed a very famous speech. That speech is now known as the Khitab of Qadir or the Sermon of Qadir. In the coming weeks, we want to focus more on the contents of this famous sermon of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Each week until Eid al-Ghadir, we'll be going over the Khitab of Ghadir and we'll be explaining different topics about it. The historic sermon of the Prophet, peace be upon him, on the day of Ghadir took about an hour long and can be summarized into 11 sections. This week, we will be going over the first three parts. Number one, in the first part of the sermon, the Prophet, peace be upon him, praised God and mentioned some of the characteristics of God and afterward confessed to his bandigi towards God. In the second part, the Prophet, peace be upon him, focused on the main points of the speech and told the people that he was assigned from God to relay them a very important command about Ali ibn Ali Talib salam. He stated that if he does not relay this message to the people, he has not completed his prophethood and fears God's punishment. In the third part, he announced the imamat of the twelve imams after himself until the end of the world in order to seize any greed. One of the important points from the Prophet's speech was about the universality of imamat and that it's meant for all people in all times and all places and that the words of the imam shall have influence in all matters and they are full representatives on behalf of God and his messengers in all issues related to haram and halal. Stay tuned next week for the other sections of the ceremony and other interesting information about it. Ali Amir al Mu'minin, Ali Imam Muttaqin, Ali Tamam Hastiye, Zahray Atharu Nabi, Zahray Atharu Nabi. Salam, we are here with Agha Islami giving an interview for Hajj. Okay, Salam Hajj Agha Islami. Please provide an intro to Hajj. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Hajj is a duty that we all have to perform as Muslims at least once in our lives to get up from wherever we are once you're able to become independent and pay for yourself and support for yourself. Get up and go to the holy city of Mecca. You get to see the Kaaba. You have to do a number of rituals there and... Once you finish everything, it takes about four or five days, you become Haji. Thank you. What happens in Hajj exactly? 
Well, it's a very long story of things that happen in Hajj, but everybody has their own specific experiences. It's really hard to talk about. Some of the things you have to do is you walk in first, you have to remove all your clothes and you wear two towels. You call out to Allah, say, I came. And then you get up and go to the Kaaba. You over there, you have to walk seven times around. You pray. And then you go in between Safa and Marwa about seven times. Then you wait for the day. Of, then you have to cut a nail off and you can come out of your two towels. You take a break for a few days until you have to go to the holy land of Arafat. You have to sit in Arafat on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah all day. That's it. That's all you do there. You just sit. And once that's finished, at night you get up and go to Muzdalifa. Then in the morning you go to Mena and you throw stones, seven stones. And you continue that for three days. Throwing these seven stones at these different shayateen that are there. You have to end your hajj with one more tawaf, a salat, a sa'i, which is the safa marwa. And then you do another tawaf and you finish everything you had to do in hajj. Thank you. What's a good memory you have from hajj and how did it feel to have that memory? Well, there's a lot of good memories from hajj, but... Uh, to be put on the spot and remember one specific one was I guess one day when we were sitting and uh, I gave this memory last time I was there when I came back we were sitting in Arafat and normally I would think that in Arafat you don't have to do anything you just sit but I was blessed to go visit the Jambazan uh, in the tent in Arafat uh, who are the people who gave limbs and stuff during for their religion and for their country and for what they believed in. So I was sitting with them and all of a sudden a wind came and knocked over a stick that was holding up their tent. And I noticed immediately that one of these Jambazan who was missing a leg was the first one to get up and hold that tent up really, really firm. So that was a really, really eye-opener for me that even when you are missing some things, you still have to do your best and act upon what you do have. Thank you. And last but not least, what does it feel like to wear an ihram and how exactly do you put it on? It's one of the most holiest clothes you can wear, but I'll be very, very honest. It is the most uncomfortable thing I've ever worn in my entire life. But at the end, when you really look back and you look at your experiences, you're like, wow, it was just another part of the experience that you really uh, enjoy. Inshallah, everybody gets the chance to wear their own ihram while they're alive. And is there anything else you would like to share with the group of Mohibam before you leave? I'd like to say I'll miss everybody, we'll remember everybody there. I look forward to, inshallah, traveling with everybody. I'll be praying for that, inshallah, to such holy lands like this. And I ask for all of their forgiveness, if they have seen or heard or I've done anything wrong to them because we're going to such a holy land and Allah only knows if we'll be given the opportunity to see them again. So, inshallah, we hope to have them all with us on the other side. We'll remember everybody. I ask them not to forget me from their prayers as I will not forget them from mine. Thank you. We hope that you have a safe trip to Mecca. <laughs> Imam Hassan Askari was murdered on Friday morning, 8th of Rabi al Awal of the year 260 Hijji. Upon his death, Imam Mahdi Imam Imamat began. At the beginning of his Imamat, he was only a child, similar to Prophet Isa and Prophet Yahya and also Imam Hadi It is important to note that the knowledge, wisdom, and other traits of the Prophets and Imams are not acquired over time. In other words, they don't require to age and gain knowledge and experience. For example, Prophet Isa while only beginning an infant a couple of days old in his mother's arm, dated to the temple scholars, Inni Abdullah atani al kitab wa ja'alni nabiya. The complete story of this event is outlined in Surah Maryam. However, at the time, there were other people wanting to claim to be the next Imam. After Imam Hassan Askari alayhi salam's death, his brother Jafar wanted to pray on his brother's dead body, and by doing so, he wanted to claim he was his successor. He was known as Jafar Kazab, Jafar the liar. 
and while denying the birth of Imam Mahdi salam, he had had the intention of falsely claiming the Imamat. The true companions and students of Imam Hassan Askari salam, who knew that Jaffa was an incompetent person, were startled that he was standing in front to lead the prayer. Suddenly, a bright young child came up from behind and held Jaffa's cloak and stated, Dear uncle, go back, because I am more qualified to pray upon my father. We know that in Islam, only a masum, or an infallible person, can pray upon another at masum's dead body. Jafar, whom was frightened, and went back, and Imam Mahdi salam prayed upon his father's body. Through this event, the Imam of Imam Mahdi salam became evident to everyone, and Jafar's false claims became evident also. Jafar, whom was disgraced by this event, informed the governor of the time. However, Imam Mahdi salam finished the prayer and left that place, before the governmental agents arrived. But now the governmental agents were aware of Imam Hassan Askari alayhi salam's child, whom they were trying to find and kill for years, and therefore started to search everywhere for him. It was after this event that Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, upon God's command and for the sake of protecting himself, went into Qaybat. However, during this time, Imam Mahdi alayhi salam's imamat has not stopped. He has proceeded with his duties, and there are many documented instances of him helping those in need, guiding the wrongdoers, healing ill people, and reguiding the people who have lost their paths. Thus, his qaybat does not disallow him to carry on his divine duties. Inshallah, in the next lessons, we will talk more about the topic of the qaybat of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam in order to better understand it and, more importantly, become aware of our duties during this time. يا أبا صالح بيا می شود آیا که روزی پا نهی در خانه ام می شود آیا که روزی پا نهی در خانه ام بر کنی از نور زیبای رو خط کاشانه ام می شود زنده بمانم تا به موعود ظهور می شود زنده بمانم تا به موعود ظهور تا ببینم در نگاه خسته قدری سرور